everybody. Welcome back to our third and final session for this Rebuild Conference. So glad that you have joined us during this time and what an amazing time it has been. Grateful for Pastor Steve's uh, phenomenal and impactful message on us learning how to build our lives on Christ. Uh, I am here today with one of my favorite people, the ever so slender and thin <laughs> uh, during quarantine, Pastor Simon. What's happening, sir? Such a joy to be with Siv here at Every Nation Rosebank family throughout Southern Africa. It's good to be together tonight. Our third and final session, as Siv said, we have looked at uh, being refreshed by the power of the Holy Spirit, being repurposed. And tonight we're in for a treat. We're going to be released by the power of the Holy Spirit to go into areas of society and make a great impact for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you, join us as we worship the King together, as we lift Him up, because we know that when He's lifted up, He'll draw men to Himself. Join us. Andi Andi la Andi kwenning o di tra Andi sia Anon srede Andi of gesta na ye
your word shape the earth creator of wonder our victory is praise your light breaks the darkness removes all our shame your goodness transforms us our victory is praise
Holy Spirit, move among us. Come, Holy Spirit, flow living water.
Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your fire. Thank you for being here tonight with us. We are so grateful that your spirit is here. Lord, thank you that you are at work in our midst. Thank you, Lord God, that we can sing about you. Thank you that, God, we can worship you and continue to raise up our voice despite all that's happening around us. We want to say you are Lord. You are King above all else. We lift your name on high, God. We raise you high, Father, and we say Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Even in the midst of crisis, we say, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. You are raised, you are glorified, you are lifted up. Lord, your word says, when you draw men to yourself, Lord, you will continue to draw men to yourself when you are lifted up. Friends, I want to read for us uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 49. Behold, I send the promise of my father upon you but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high scripture encourages us as it encouraged the disciples at the time of Jesus ascension even as we are on this weekend of the Pentecost that tarry wait until you are endued with power from on high I want to encourage us to wait and to learn to wait on the Lord to learn to wait until we are endued with power from on high. We need this power today. We need this power to rebuild our economy. We need this power to have solutions to the crisis we are facing with the coronavirus. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. As we wait on Him, we know that He is at work. Father, thank You that Your Holy Spirit is with us. Thank You that God, this is the promise that You gave us And we stand on your promises this afternoon and this evening. We trust that, God, you're going to move in ways we've never expected before. We're going to see the move of God. We're going to see revival. We're going to see the power of the Holy Spirit on the streets of our cities. Throughout all of Southern Africa, we're going to see the power of God. We're going to see revival in Africa and the rest of the world. God has called us to see revival. And we believe that that revival is here and now. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And thanks to our band for leading us so well. Let's continue to praise God and glorify Him. Amen. It is now my joy and honor to introduce our next speaker, Pastor Tim Johnson. Pastor Tim is a senior pastor of Orlando World Outreach Center in Florida. He has also led Bethel World Outreach in Nashville, Tennessee. Pastor Tim has played professional football, the NFL, to the point of winning the Super Bowl in 1991. Respect for that, sir. Pastor Tim is married to Lichelle, and they are proud parents of three young ladies and one son. I want to share briefly on how Pastor Tim has impacted my life. I've seen how passionate he is with his family, how passionate he is with influencing cities and nations with the kingdom of God. I've also seen how passionate he is about prayer, how he has walked through the whole entire state praying for the state of Florida. And recently, I've enjoyed praying together with him since the breakout of COVID-19. We honor you, sir. Hello, Every Nation family from Orlando, Florida. I'm Tim Johnson, senior pastor of Orlando World Outreach Center. And what an honor it is to be with you for this first ever virtual conference for the Every Nation Southern Africa region. Um, I want to say that this does not let you off the hook from my wife and I seeing you face to face at the appointed time. I want to give a special thanks to Pastor Roger Pierce for his uh, engaging me at the World Conference to be a part of this. It is an honor. Thank you, Pastor Roger. Also want to say thank you to Pastor Simon, who has been a great uh, convener of many of you to pray with us on Wednesdays and Fridays for our Uh, global prayer and fasting time on Instagram Live. I want us to begin our time with Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. 
And I want to look at two scriptures in Romans chapter 8. We'll look in verse 18 and verse 19. Romans 8, verse 18 and 19. It says in Romans 8, 18 and 19, For I consider that our present sufferings are not worth, worthy, are not worth comparing, excuse me, with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. Father, I pray for the blessing of your presence to manifest in every home and every heart. And that you would make yourself known to us, but that you would also make yourself known through us in Jesus' name. Amen. I have been given the assignment to address the subject, release into the city. And I have to tell you, I really appreciate this subject because from Orlando to South Af Africa, as we've all been living through this global pandemic and living in quarantine for just countless weeks now, there has been in this time a release of some things in unprecedented ways in cities all over the world. Our city, your city are in different degrees experiencing a lot of the same things. And what we're experiencing is the release of heaviness. There is a heaviness that is so real and palpable that people are feeling crushed and overwhelmed and exhausted under it. It's the heaviness of fear and uncertainty. It's the heaviness of domestic violence. It's the heaviness of suicide. Even in South Africa, there is a suicide rate of 13.4 persons per 100,000 people, which is the four times the global average of 3.6. There is a, an epidemic that is an undercurrent of all of this virus. And it's fear, it's darkness, it's heaviness. And as much as we need first responders, we need healthcare workers, we need our government leaders at every level, we need uh, all the educators, none of these people can actually stop what is being released in the spirit into our cities. What is our responsibility as leaders? What is our role as leaders to address these things? It is to be like the sons of Issachar, who knew the times in which they live, but they also knew what to do. But what do we do? What, what is there to do? One of the things that we have to do about what's being released into our cities is fight. We have to fight. But please remember that when we fight, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers, powers and rulers of darkness in this present world and spiritual wickedness in high places. Which simply means, if you fight in the realm that you can see, you will miss the victory that can only come in the realm that you cannot see with your natural eyes. In other words, if we are fighting darkness just to see things get better, then we'll lose sight of the real fight when things get better. As if somehow the goal was to have the victory of things getting better. We need things to get better, but that's not the victory. That's not the only victory that has been planned for us to experience and release in our cities. I don't know that just getting better is going to actually do what needs to be done to address what is being released in the spirit over cities. I submit to you, it is not just seeing things get better. It's that South Africa would see the glory of God. Because the Apostle Paul just said to us, I consider that our present sufferings, which means he, he, he's acknowledging the sufferings. I don't believe in a faith that denies the facts. I don't believe in a faith that names it, claims it, and blabs it, grabs it. I don't believe in a faith that's hyper-spiritual. Paul said, no, we're suffering. There's suffering in this world. 
We live in this world, there's suffering in this world. And Paul says, but I have to weigh it all. Suffering's glory, suffering's glory. The glory far outweighs the suffering. Why is that, Paul? Because of the glory that's going to be revealed in us. And then Paul goes on and, and then he says that the earth, he says, the creation waits in eager expectation. For what? For us. For the sons of God to be revealed. There's nothing impressive about us in our own natural state. But it's what is in us. The world is waiting to see and get released into the city. You see, Satan will always walk around like he's undefeated in our cities until we show up as we should. Because when Paul says the glory which shall be revealed, Paul is talking about the reality that the glory exists now. It is a glory which sometimes we don't trust that the glory exists now and also will be a glory that is to come when we fight the powers of darkness for victory rather than fight the powers of darkness from victory. When you're fighting for victory, you're fighting for something you don't think you have. But when you're fighting from victory, it's fighting from the victory that has already been won. And what is that victory? That victory is over darkness. The glory of God is revealed in victory over darkness. You see, the glory of God is an overpowering experience of divine activity that's released through the character, from the character of God. The word glory in the Greek, when you put heavy and weight together, it's heavy weight. Heavy weight. It's the manifestation of God's presence. It's the manifestation not just of his presence, but of his power. It's when the power of God is revealed to save. It's the power of God revealed to resurrect. It's the power of God revealed to actually deliver, set free, make whole. It is the power of God being revealed to transform and pierce the darkness with the wonder of his light. How does this work? How does this, this glory and this victory work? Well, it works a lot like a boxing match. You think of a boxing match, there's all kinds of weight classes in a boxing match. There's uh, featherweight, lightweight, uh, bantamweight, and then there's heavyweight. Heavyweight is usually the, the, the most highly regarded, highly rewarded fight. It's the heavyweight fight. And since the Garden of Eden, Satan stepped into the ring of the earth and knocked out Adam and Eve and has since walked around. He's just been walking around the earth. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 said he's the God of this world. So he's been walking around crushing nations, crushing cities, crushing campuses, crushing people's lives for centuries like he was the heavyweight champ until... Can somebody say until? Until 2,000 years ago, another man that looked like a man, but he was God, stepped on the scene, stepped into the arena to take on the heavyweight champion of this world. And when he stepped into the ring, he didn't step into the ring with a bunch of weapons or a host of angels or physical strength. He stepped into the ring with a cross. And when he stepped into the ring with a cross, he allowed himself to take every blow that Satan and his host of powers and principalities could unleash against him. It's the same weapons that were unleashed to destroy uh, priests and prophets and kings of old and rulers and authorities. Throughout history, the enemy has been dismantling and destroying people for centuries. And so when he unleashed this, he hit Jesus with sickness and disease and fear and the wrath of God came upon him. He knocked Jesus out. He knocked him out. 
And all of a sudden, just like in boxing, there's a 10 count. One, two, and they try to go to 10. If there's no response, then the fight's over. So Jesus got knocked out. And then there was a count from heaven. One, Friday. Two, Saturday. Three, Sunday, and he got up, and when he got up, he got up with the power to crush every power of hell, to annihilate, to destroy, to undo every weapon of the enemy against his kingdom and against his people and became the heavyweight champion, not just of this world, but of the world to come. He is the king. He's the king. Jesus Christ is the heavyweight champion. And when he rose from the dead, he offered repentance and forgiveness for everybody that want to be in his camps. See, boxers always have camps. And if you're in their camp, you're considered a champ. So when you repent and believe and you're born again, the Bible says that he that sins is of the devil, but this is the purpose that Jesus came, 1 John 3, 8, to annihilate the works of the devil. Annihilate. He's not playing nice. And we annihilated the works of the devil. It then says in 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. What does that mean? Because he's the heavyweight. His glory is real his glory is in me, which means I'm a heavyweight champion because of the spirit of the heavyweight champion. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 8, 11 said it abides in you. Why? Not just so we can watch Netflix in a good mood. It's so you can be released into your city and reveal the glory of God. It's you he's releasing with his glory in you. It's us as a people. And if you don't know you're a heavyweight, you'll walk around like a lightweight. You have a choice to either walk around and make moves like a heavyweight or walk around and carry a heavy weight. How do we release the glory of God into our cities? Number one, you got to pray for the glory. You have to pray for the glory. And when I say pray, let me ask you this. Do you mean it? Do you actually mean it? When you pray, do you mean it? You see, a lot of times we're praying with hope instead of the kind of faith. Hope is good. But faith puts me in a place where I know what I'm praying for, I have. And what I need you to understand is that when you pray, you're making moves like a heavyweight because you're pulling a victory from 2,000 years ago and you're releasing it into your city today, tomorrow, this year. I remember when God called me to walk across the state of Florida back in 2013, March 3rd, and then Walking across, and it's a long story, God actually spoke to me. It was pretty dramatic, and confirmation after confirmation, 698 miles, 11 weeks of my life spent on the road, and there are miracles for days that I, I could tell you about. And from that time, we began to have prayer walks once a month around Orlando. One of our most recent was at an elementary school where we've partnered with, and we were praying in the in the uh, playground area. And as we were praying, I felt an unction to actually pray that God would send angels because they had been experiencing some very difficult scenarios at the school. And as I did, I watched my COO of the church nearly fall to the ground. And when he leaned over and he was, he was crying uncontrollably, after we finished our moment, I, I, I walked up to him and I just said, is everything okay? And he could barely talk. He said, when, when you begin to pray for angels, I looked up and I saw them. I saw angels coming down over this school. 
an overpowering experience of divine activity that's released from the character of God was manifesting at a public school. When you pray, you're releasing the glory of God wherever you are. Not only do we have to pray, we can experience the glory of God, but we have to pray for it. Not only do you pray for the glory, you have to prepare for the glory. God has a glory for us, but we must be prepared for it. There are different degrees and different levels of glory. And the highest level of glory can only be attained by the highest level of faith. And not just faith for things, but faith as a lifestyle. You see, Paul said in Galatians 5, 6, he said, in Christ Jesus, circumcision, uh, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. But what is most important is faith expressing itself in love. You want to see the glory of God. If we want to see the glory of God, we must grow in the love of God. We must grow in the love of God. Not my love or your love, but it must be that the love of God in Christ Jesus is manifesting in us because the love of God is proportionate to the glory of God. If we want to see more glory, we must walk in more love. So we must pray for the glory, prepare for the glory, but we also must walk in the glory. We have to walk in the glory. I love what Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 8. It says, this, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. How do we walk in the glory? We commit ourselves to not only being disciples, but making disciples. Because right now the world is scrambling. Researchers are scrambling to try to find a vaccine for the coronavirus to stop people from dying. And it would be criminal if someone discovered a vaccine and didn't offer to every person that had this virus. The only issue is when they discover a vaccine and people stop dying and they live longer, they're still going to die. Because there's a virus stronger than COVID-19 that has existed since the Garden of Eden, and that is the virus of sin. And we don't need researchers and scientists to go help us find a vaccine. I tell you what, if you look in Romans 1.18, it'll tell you the vaccine is, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to those who believe. And here's the thing. It's criminal if we don't share this gospel because there are people who are dying. And if we share the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only vaccine that can stop people from dying and not having eternal life. Every time we share the gospel, we're releasing the vaccine into our cities. Our cities are craving for COVID testing and trying to find this vaccine. But let me tell you, all those things are important. There is nothing more important in this hour than you being released into your city to pray for the glory of God, to prepare for the glory of God, and to walk in the glory of God. Love you so much. Can't wait to see you at the appointed time. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord keep us all until we meet again. Go release the glory into your city. In Jesus' name. Pastor Tim, thank you so much for that message. Thank you for reminding us and igniting us towards sharing the gospel to a broken world that needs healing. And now it is my great privilege as we land this plane for this rebuilt conference to introduce a man that needs no introduction. But for the sake of making him feel slightly uncomfortable, I want to introduce to you Pastor Roger Pierce. 
He's married to one of my most favorite people to hang around with, uh, uh, Pastor Nicola Pierce. They have two sons and recently uh, a daughter since his older son got married. He is the senior elder of our Every Nation Johannesburg family and the apostolic leader of our Every Nation Southern Africa movement. He also sits on the global uh, leadership team that helps to govern uh, all the churches around our every nation, family, all across the world. Pastor Roger is a wise man, patient man, passionate man, highly skilled man, but for me, what makes him a great man is his faithfulness. And Pastor Roger, as you get up to preach, I wanna thank you for your faithfulness, not only to your family or to our region, but most importantly, your faithfulness to God. And today, as we hear the word, thank you that your faithfulness has gone before you and may that same faithfulness be imparted in our region as we seek to be released to bring the kingdom to our nation and the nations of this continent. Bless you guys. Enjoy the message. Good evening, family and friends. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Pastor Tim, for such a great word that we would pray, that we would prepare, that we would bring the glory of God. I believe I have a word for you tonight, and I just pray that you would receive that what the Holy Spirit wants to give to you. I want you to imagine and come north with me to our beautiful neighbor, Botswana. Travel thousands of kilometers from South Africa right to the border of Botswana and Zambia. If you get to Itoshapan, you've gone too far to the west. But if you come to the east, there's a place called Mahadi Khadi. Now, tens of thousands of years ago, the great Zambezi River flowed into Mahadi Khadi. And it made a freshwater lake like the world has never seen. Bigger than Lake Superior, bigger than Lake Victoria. It was the greatest freshwater lake that the world had ever seen. Bigger than the whole of the Free State, 120,000 square kilometers. And around it, was every animal and every tree that Africa has ever seen. It was a veritable paradise. It was an Eden. But you know what happened? The river moved. And if the river moves, everything dies. I want to take you to another river. 1763 in North America, there were two great towns on the Mississippi. There was New Orleans right at the mouth, and there was St. Louis, thousands of kilometers upriver. And a bunch of French settlers decided to found a town which they called Little Gulf. It was on the El Camino Royal, which was the Spanish Royal Road. It was the intersection of this road and, and this river. They formed it, this little town called Little Gulf, and later on became Rodney, Mississippi. And it prospered. There was cotton and there was business and there were two banks and it was the, the state's first opera house. And there were two newspapers and 52 shops and children and la laughter. And, and they came to voting what was going to be Mississippi's capital. And it missed it by three votes. If you go there today, there's one dirt road in and there's nothing else. Because this is what happens. If the river moves, everything dies. And the river, the Mississippi River moved. And so today, Rodney, Mississippi is a ghost town. I want to take you to another river that Jesus spoke of in John 7, verse 37. It was the final feast. Now the Jews had seven feasts. Three were described as great feasts. Three feasts were at the beginning of the year in the first month, one in the middle, three at the end. Now this was the end of everything. It was the seventh feast. And it was on the last day of the last feast. And Jesus gets up. And he cries out in the face of, of all of their religion. It says Jesus literally cried. He shouted and he said, If any man is thirsty, come to me. Come to me and drink. And out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Talking about the Holy Spirit. He was saying, doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what state you're in. If you will come to him. If you will come and if you will drink. The word come and drink is, is present imperative. It literally means to come and to keep coming. To drink and to keep drinking. And some of you have been Christians for a while. And you need to come back 
and drink again. And, and some of you are young in the faith and you need to come and keep coming. You need to drink and tre- keep drinking. And some of you are called to do great things and you need to come and keep coming. And you need to drink and keep drinking. Now C.S. Lewis in his children's stories, the Narnia Chronicles, is one called the Silver Chair. And there's this hero, heroine rather, Jill Paul, who at this stage is a real egotist. And she's treated her fellow companions in Narnia so badly. And she, she moves away from them and she comes to the edge of a forest and, and she sees this great lion go in and somehow she's drawn into the forest. As she comes into the forest, a great thirst comes upon her and she starts looking for water and she's just desperately thirsty. Eventually she can smell it and she can hear it and she can see glimpses of it. And she comes through to the glade and there before her is the most beautiful stream that she's ever seen, gorgeous. But between her and the stream is this great lion with its head up facing her. And the lion looks at her and she's just afraid and she's desperately thirsty and he says to her, are you thirsty? And she says, I'm dying of thirst. So he says, then drink. She hesitates. She suggests that he goes away and and he growls at her. And then she says, I daren't come and drink. And then the lion says, then you'll die of thirst. Taking a step nearer, Jill says, I suppose I must go and look for another stream. And the great lion, who's a type of Christ, Aslan, he says, there is no other stream. She considers these words. She's frantic with thirst and eventually she musters up the courage and the humility and she comes to the lion and she comes to the river and she drinks of the most glorious, refreshing, coolest, delicious living water, refreshing water that she's ever drunk of. Now, we don't know what happened to Mahari Khadi exactly. We don't know why the Zambezi River moved. We think, the geologists think they know. They say it was probably the Chobe Fault. But we do know what happened to Rodney, Mississippi. Debris came downstream, branches, odds and ends, came against the side of the riverbank, and the people ignored it. And then more debris came, and a little bit of silt, a little bit of sand, and the people ignored it. Eventually a small sandbar formed, and the people ignored it. And eventually a massive sandbar formed. Years went by, years went by, and eventually the great Mississippi River was pushed five kilometers to the side. You know, I remember praying for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, the Spirit of God was moving powerfully. And every person I prayed for received a touch and spoke in tongues or, or there was some great manifestation of God's love and power and presence upon them. And when I came to the last person, became a friend with Nicola and I, nothing happened. And I couldn't understand it. And uh, she couldn't understand it. But later on, we, we counseled her and it, it turned out that through her life and through her actions, she was grieving the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says in Ephesians 4 verse 30, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Don't allow debris, unconfessed sin, stuff in your life where you have constantly ignored what the Holy Spirit is saying to you and asking you to do and asking you to stop doing. The river is meant to flow. And you know what rivers do? They bring oxygen. They bring nutrients, they bring life, they bring power, they bring cleansing. And the river of God is meant to flow in us, upon us, and through us to the world. There's a great river in Ezekiel. There's two images of the temple. One at the beginning, where the temple is described as corrupt. But then later on, Ezekiel 40 through to 47, the temple is described And in 47, we see how from the temple begins to flow this river. And and at first, it's imperceptible. It's just ankle deep. And sometimes when the Spirit of God comes upon us, it, it might not be a massive manifestation. But then the river grows and increases and becomes knee deep. 
then it becomes waist deep. Eventually it becomes so deep that, that you can't even swim in it. It's just, you can't even stand in it. It's just over your head. For the Jewish mind, this, this was inconceivable. Because for them, the closer you got to the temple, the more there was. But here it's teaching us something else. And that is as you go, the Spirit of God comes upon you. As you go and preach the word, signs and wonders will follow. As you go and make disciple, as you go into the workplace and trust God for wisdom and power and solutions, you will see miracles and you will see signs and you will see wonders. I, I think of our president, Pastor Steve Mill, of how he left Mississippi, not Rodney, but another Mississippi, another town in Mississippi, and how as he went to Manila that he experienced the greatest move of God in and through his life. We should be thirsty for God. We should be thirsty for his infilling. And we should be trusting not just for rivers in us, for us, but that rivers of living water would flow out of us and that they would touch the world around us. If you go to Rodney, Mississippi today, there is water, but it's stagnant. It's dead. You know, the Jewish mind had, had, had all different ways, six different ways to describe water. The water in Rodney, Mississippi is stagnant because it's not going anywhere and it's not doing anything. The rivers of living water are meant to flow into us and through us and touch the world. Will you acknowledge your thirst? Will you come to Jesus? Will you unblock the debris in your life and allow those rivers to flow in you and through you? There was a song many years ago in the 60s before all of you were born called Desert Pete. And Desert Pete had left a little note on an old hand pump. And along came this thirsty cowboy. And this is what the note said. He said, for all those who come, take the cup that's hidden under the rock. Don't drink it. But prime the pump with that cup. And you'll have more water than you can ever drink. And when you're finished, fill up that cup again and leave it for the next person. And, and so this cowboy is faced with this dilemma. He's so thirsty and he's not even sure if the pump will work. But he steps out in faith, if you will, and he primes the pump. And more water than he could ever drink is, is gushing out. And once he's done, once he's filled up everything and watered his horse, he fills up the cup and he leaves the note. Will you bring, even if it's just a little bit of faith, and will you ask God, for a fresh infilling. And those of you who have got debris in your life that is quenching the Spirit of God, that is grieving the Spirit of God, will you bring those before God because He will cleanse you. He will forgive you. And for all of us as believers, will you ask again that the Spirit of God would flow through you, that the rivers of living water would flow through you and touch the world. Let's pray together. Spirit of God, come. Spirit of God, come upon every person listening. Spirit of God, refresh us. Lord, we repent of any debris, Lord God, of any stuff in our lives. Lord, that, that quenches, that hinders the flow of your Holy Spirit. Lord, fill us again. Cause us to be the men and women that we're called to be. Bring your kingdom, bring your light, bringing your rivers of living water to this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, we're going to have a time now of receiving, of repentance, of releasing. I'm going to ask the band just to join me at the front and begin to take us into, into God's presence where He can take away the debris. Some of you have got disappointments, sins, things that have happened. We're just going to trust that the, the river of God comes afresh on us. Those rivers of living water begin to bubble up. For some of you, it's the time of saying, God, come in. Wash away. Come in afresh. And if you need to get down on your knees, lie before the Lord, do whatever you need to do. But we're going to begin to worship God and ask for His fresh infilling. For some of you, it's a time now for you to say, Lord, use me. Fill me that you might use me. That there might be a release of the power of God into this world. That's what the whole conference is about that we might be released, that we might be the hands, the mouth, the feet of Jesus. Let's worship the Lord together.
we your people all together bring you honor give you reverence standing as one in your presence by your spirit you have called us a chosen people sons and daughters standing as one in your presence this is your church god build it this is your church god build it jesus cornerstone god build it Church. God. 
your church God building? This is your church God building. Jesus. Jesus. On the stone. On the stone. God Thank you, everybody, for such a wonderful time. We have just sensed God move in our midst. And we know that the impact of this is going to be seen for many years. Thank you to everybody who's made this happen. Every Nation Rosebank and Every Nation N1 and, and Belinda and Andrew and just so many people have made this happen. The communication team, we are so grateful. Pierre in particular, thank you for your labors. We are so grateful for everybody who labors to make things happen. Thank you for you for being with us. And, and thank you so much for every church and every pastor who's opened up their services that we might have have this message of the gospel being sent to you across all the airwaves god bless you and thank you family we've had an amazing time with the holy spirit we have been refreshed we have been repurposed and now we've been released to go out there carrying this two gospel messages the gospel of salvation and the gospel of the kingdom we're going to influence our cities our communities our nation and the nations of the world so let's go